My name is Ibn Hashim Bakari, and I'm the founder and president of Lights and Sirens International. Lights and Sirens International is geared towards helping those less fortunate by providing them with the essential needs of clothing, school supplies, toys, backpacks. We also are tackling one of the most difficult topics in our society and community right now, and that is bridging the gap between law enforcement and the minority community. For the last 12 years, we have traveled to the Dominican Republic with law enforcement officials from across the country, helping those in the community, but more importantly, trying to address the issues of systematic racism. Here in the state of Rhode Island, we are following up and doing just that, working with state police, local police departments, and school systems to help students to better gauge and understand what's taking place across the country. We're hoping that through our nonprofit organization and our programming through Bocce Play and Cornhole, we will be able to help bridge that gap between law enforcement and the minority community by understanding each perspective. We understand that protests is viable and needed, but nothing can be done when there's arguments. So we are bringing both sides to the table with the help of organizations at the Black Lives Matter, state, local, and federal law enforcement personnel to have these conversations so that we can make a change in our community. Trying to solve any problem involving police brutality and unnatural loss of life, you have to understand the history of police brutality. And from the very beginning of America, the police job was to keep black people in their place. They were never there to protect black people. They were never there to assist black people. The police have always been an agent of force, an agent of the state to oppress black revolutionary thought and behavior. And so as long as you have discontented black folk, you're always going to have police violence. We can never be satisfied as long as the Negro is the victim of the unspeakable horrors of police brutality. We can never be satisfied. Well. Right now, uh, things in our community and in our society are pretty volatile. Um, a lot of it is, seems to be fueled by some negative images, uh, some negative media publicity, and unfortunately our world is being run by a lot of political agendas. Um, granted, both sides have a role to play, both civilian and police. So while, while we're trying to stay proactive versus reactive to what's taking place in our country, we're addressing all of the topics of what, what applies to every human being. You know, when you talk about ego, that's something that applies to every person. I don't care if you're white, black, green, or blue. I don't care if you're a woman or male. Everybody has an ego, and sometimes our egos can mislead us. Yes, there's racial tension in this country, which has never been addressed. And so therefore, until it's addressed, that's when we will finally see a change. So all I'm trying to do is simply just bring two sides of the equation to the table to have a discussion and talk out what are the differences. Speaking for these guys as well, I'm a, a generation slightly uh, further than them, you know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? But I'm still young, and I've, you know, I've, I've had my run-ins with the cops, negative and positive. You know, I'm a social work major, so I'm able to, you know, empathize, see both sides, always, always, always. Okay. So this is my biggest question to the cops. Okay. So what is really done when a, a cop isn't sensible? Okay. Because I've been in situations where, right, kids. I, I've seen it a lot of times. I've seen unsensible people. Bad things happen to them. But have been in many situations and seen many situations where the cops were unsensible and there is I feel as there's never an accountability for the unsensible cop and when there is partners right and good cop bad cop wherever it may be the good cop is never checking the bad cop the bad cop is usually running a rampage doing whatever he wants and the good cop is usually in the back watching the injustice happen and then it's all and then it's all done everything is done and you know we're we're in a place where cops aren't being held accountable for lethal force all right
to make the white public think that 90% or 99% of the Negroes in the Negro community are criminals. And once the white public is convinced that most of the Negro community is a criminal element, then this automatically paves the way for the police to move into the Negro community exercising Gestapo tactics, stopping any black man who is in the, on, on the sidewalk, whether he is guilty or whether he is innocent, whether he is well-dressed or whether he is poorly dressed, whether he is educated or whether he is dumb, whether he's a Christian or whether he's a Muslim, as long as he is black and a member of the Negro community, the white public thinks that the white policeman is justified in going in there and trampling on that man's civil rights and on that man's human rights. There is a due process, and I think a lot of times the public uh, gets frustrated uh, not understanding the process. And the thing is this, uh, and it's in place because there was a time where officers uh, were fired and treated unjustly because of politics. So I was in with politician J Jane Doe, and he's in with politician John Doe. I could get fired if there was a complaint against me. Uh, and he would be all set. So that's why that's in place. But even with, uh, with that, we're not giving them extra rights, we're just uh, taking the process. And I can tell you, we've had officers who are going through it and they go, you know what, it's time for me to go, I'm gonna retire. So it's to the extent that some officers choose to leave the profession, rightfully so some of them, uh, because they know they're gonna be held accountable. Because we are saying, hey, what were you doing? And this, there's gonna be ramifications. Yeah, um, um, police, I think police officers bring their um, experiences to the job. My question is, is there a way for police to be impartial? Is there any way that they can do their jobs without some of the things that they've experienced, whether it's in their, you know, growing up in their childhood or their prejudices or their biases or even their experience on the job. Can we get police officers to be impartial and just do their job without, because I think that's where the problem is. Some of them are bringing things to their job that are not helpful, hel healthy or helpful when it comes to policing. So I'm asking you because you have had a lot to um, probably, you know, dissect how can, can police officers be impartial and do their job? Uh, absolutely, and I think the part that's important, like one, again, even framed our, our relationship, we started out playing basketball. But one of the greatest things that ever happened to me, I took a contract, I played over in Ecuador. But before I played, or before I, I started playing, they immersed me with a family. They let me spend a month with a family in Ecuador to you know, kind of be culturally um, immersed so I could have a better understanding of their culture. And I can't tell you, how important that was. In some areas, uh, what they do with cer certain officers, especially if they aren't from more of an urban uh, background, they have them go and have Sunday dinner with a couple of families mm -hmm. where they can start to have that contact and understand that Big Mama is a mother and right. that little Pookie is, <laughs> is a child who has dreams and aspirations. And, you know, so a lot of those barriers for me even moving into a culture absolutely different than mine, but living with a family, and I'm not saying that we should have officers stay for an entire month, but right. there should definitely be required interaction outside of crisis. Hi, I'm Sergeant Alondo Braxton. I'm with the Smithfield Police Department. I've been a police officer now for almost 23 years. Uh, one of the things I think about with the conflict of, with police in the community is just a misunderstanding. And the misunderstanding is on both sides. I truly feel that, you know, people understood that both the police and the community are really just one. Um, I grew up the same exact way these kids grew up. And I just happened to choose to be a police officer. But I'm the same exact person that I was when I was a kid. I'm the same as these young kids. And if they realized how much we're alike, 
versus how much you focus on the difference. I think the, that community, that gap would be much less. Conflict goes, you know, for generations and generations. Um, and, um, and it's not without merit. It's not. Um, I know that for the last 20 years, People have been working, including myself, working to bridge that gap between law enforcement and young people, law enforcement in the community. Um, I believe it is, it is very important that, um, that the community does have a relationship with, uh, with law enforcement, and law enforcement equally has a relationship with the community and that relationship should be built on the foundation of trust, uh, fairness, openness and transparency. Um, As a friend, I feel like, oh, um, this is a problem, we need to do this. I'm not against you, I'm with you, we just want to like get the problem better. I feel like most sensible people would be like, oh, okay, you just progress from that. So I feel like that's Most cool. sensible people. <laughs> who understands that there are a percentage of people who are not sensible? A lot of the problems that we see in the media is because the people that we're dealing with aren't those sensible people. And you're right. Most sensible people never have a problem or an issue with police. They don't on the conflict between law enforcement and the minority community? Uh, I think it's, it's, it's really unfortunate, man, that the uh, negativity, not only uh, locally but nationally, uh, there's some miscommunication, you know. I, I get it that law enforcement every day have to go out and protect and serve, but also that they fear for their own lives. But there's still a way that these things can get accomplished without having deaths, without having incidents of violence, without having protests, where the training of police and, and dealing with the community is something that needs to be dealt with so they know how to communicate with people, understand the social environment, and understand that everybody's not out there, man, trying to hurt anybody. And I know that law enforcement ain't trying to go out there every day and hurt anybody either. It's, it's just a volatile situation where no one knows how to actually engage one another. Mass murderers without incident but kill unarmed black men. How is that? There's that, That's an easy question, and Brother Moore will probably agree. We're not as afraid. Mm. We're not we're not afraid. Right. Because our life experiences is damn near hell for a lot of us anyway. Right. right? In the communities right. you grow and up in. Yeah. And well, if you I know, could say this. If I could say this before I have to run off because yes. my team is about to tip off. But again, there is a certain level like we're often made as African Americans a lot of times oh, you don't have the background or, you know, this person has more of an academic background, this, that, and the other. Well, the irony of it is that to be a really good officer, a lot of times your urban education is as, is probably more important than your formal education. That's true. And to, Absolutely. And to, 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 to Officer Brown's point, you know, I've been in a, I've been in a fight. That, a fight doesn't scare me. Right. Some people, a lot of folks that we are dealing with that are out there, Firstly, there, it, it would be the equivalent of, if I take a guy from Skid Row and I ask him to walk into a boardroom, how, how, how comfortable is he going to be? Right. Well, if I take a guy from a very homogeneous, affluent background and I drop him in on the south side of Chicago or South Central, <laughs> how impactful is There's right. a learning curve. Correct. Although, because of arrogance a lot of times, you have officers that are from these backgrounds that think, well, I I scored seventeen hundred on this. And I, you know, I know, you know, and my cousin was a law enforcement. Have you ever been punched in the face? Mm. Have you ever rolled around and tossed after that something? street smart? Right. right. And, and, you know, right. And, and and can you read mm. and can you make an urban assessment under duress where you mm. know if somebody's talking or if they're really about to make a move? That that is not taught in the academy. That's a life experience. Um, it's such a timely topic and one that, um, you know, politics has to be left out of. It's a topic that hits every community across this country.
If I could change one thing, I would say, I would say maybe getting to know each other a little bit better. We should maybe be working together more. Um, I think if they saw, if the community saw the job that we had, how difficult it can be, they'd have a better understanding of what we do. And maybe part of that is on us and teaching people uh, exactly what we do. Maybe we, we ought to do a better job with that. Uh, I would love to see people uh, from a human side realize that we have a very difficult job to do. And the first thing I would ask everyone is if, if someone says, hey, you need to come with us for a warrant or a charge, just don't resist. Just say, hey, I'm going to go and, and know that we're, you're going to be treated well and we're going to treat you like a human being. And I think if people had that message that we're humans trying to do a difficult job, um, certainly don't resist. Uh, just know that you know, a lot of the tools and hardware is there for the worst case scenario. Don't create that scenario and it's never a problem. You'll see today that people don't want to hurt anybody. It's, you just want to, you want peace. That would be it, that'd be my message. Oh, my don't mean to, for me, um, for this program for today, is to engage that um, relationship that we need with our teenagers and the police because um, it's good to have that relationship so that they know that the police are supporting them and they can have a friendly relationship. And one of the great things is how Ibn is right on the front lines and Lights and Sirens International is right there trying to bring both sides together without the, uh, can't think of the word, without the um, <laughs> distractions maybe of the media. Um, we are actually being able to have conversation, meet with, spend time with, not just the community we serve, the youth that we serve as policemen, but they're seeing us as people, we're seeing them as people, and it's forcing both dialogue and interaction that wouldn't happen under these circumstances. Unfortunately, our profession has us coming in either after a tragedy has struck or while, um, you know, we're usually authoritative when we get to meet people. That it's not always in an environment where they see us as people and not just an authority figure. There's things that police should do, there's ways they shouldn't do things. There's things they can do, there's things they cannot do. Just because you see it on a, in a snippet of a film in a media doesn't mean, yes, maybe they should have done it differently, but it doesn't mean that they're not in the task of their job, that they can't do what they're doing. While it feels like they shouldn't be doing that, they sh there's no way that he should be doing this, he legally can't. Does that make sense? So, like some of them. Again, if- Legal isn't if, always right. I'm not saying it is, but right. you're asking why police themselves aren't necessarily prosecuted. Right. Be it's because there are certain things they can do as part of their job that maybe you don't think is, is right and it shouldn't be but it doesn't mean that they're, they're wrong in doing it. They aren't able to by the rules, regulations of their city, their town, their state, whatever the case may be. It's, it's different. Every, we have 39 cities and towns, 39 municipalities in Rhode Island alone. Right. Each one of them has their own sense of rules, regulations, of what they can and that's, can't do. That's so scary as well, crazy to just think like, all right, I do like, I'd say, no, you guys are so much different than East Providence cops. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Just crossing the border, it's... That, but that's... Right. Well, good way or bad way? Not. I agree with you. <laughs> but again, like, but that's, that's... With that, there's good and bad. There's, there's legal and illegal. Yeah. And sometimes when we see something, it may be perfectly legal, but we all... Yeah, you know, that ain't right. You know what I'm saying? Uh, if we're gonna change the narrative, um, it has to be through collaboration and understanding. So events like this, uh, putting together law enforcement outside of what they do on a daily basis uh, is, is real critical in, in, in uh, establishing those relationships and connections and building upon them. That we see each other as human beings, first of all. Uh, every young person wants to be seen uh, for who they are. And, and I know that law enforcement, they want to be seen as human beings that happen to be law enforcement. They have a, they have
have a, uh, a responsibility. It's invaluable. Um, what Lights and Sirens International is doing is different or I'm not aware of any other organization that is is taking these steps. Um, it, being proactive in the community. Uh, it it's wonderful. Uh, and I hope we can can gain some ground from this, that we can see some real change. I hope that other communities can look at what we're doing, what Lights and Sirens International has done, um, and maybe bring it to their own community. I will leave you with this final piece. Observation is plus perception equals reality, and we all have that, which leads us all to have implicit biases, which also leads us to have egos. As we start to become accountable for our own actions, instead of blaming others for our bad choices, is then when we can start making a change in our community.